Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us again this morning on webinar 10 of our series. My name is Ian Mosley, and today we're going to be talking all about finite element modeling for magnetics design. Um, if you joined us last week, we did the first of our magnetics webinars where we talked about the sort of underpinning equations and um, some of the loss mechanisms, that sort of thing for magnetics design. Um, in recent years, we've tended to uh, start using FEM or FEA tools, finite element tools, to help with high power design because the sort of performance levels we're trying to achieve now mean that some of the parasitic effects, some of the uh, fringing fields, leakage fields, things like that, we need to know a lot more about them. We can't just make assumptions about them. So this FEA, the subject today, the FEA finite element analysis allows us a deeper insight into magnetics behavior. Uh, so I do hope it's interesting for you today. Um, on the right hand side of your screen, you should see the chat questions and polls box. So under chat, please, if you've joined us before, you'll, you'll know the drill here. Please enter any, any comments you have. If you want to say hello to anybody, please put that in the chat, chat section. Um, if you have any technical questions on the content that I'm presenting today, please do put that in the question section and we'll have a 15 minute or so uh, questions period at the end of the webinar. This webinar will be about an hour long or just under and then we'll do the questions at the end. Uh, we've also uh, got a series of polls that we want to or questions that we want to um, uh, submit to you during the course of this presentation just to get a, a better feeling on some of the technical content and, and, and in particular the, your use of FEA tools if at all. So please do respond to those polls as we go. I'm pleased to be joined on the call today by Jose. So Jose is, is taking over the management of the questions and polls session today. And then we swap roles next week where Jose will take over presenting. So it's, it's up to me today to, to do the presenting on this FEA topic. Um, so thank you, Jose, for joining. Uh, I guess we should get started. So uh, let me just share my presentation screen. Here we go. Perfect. OK, so what are we going to talk about today? Um, so firstly, I'd like to try and give you an idea on where I think uh, finite element modeling fits into magnetics design. And this is just our opinion on it based on our experience. But hopefully it'll give you an insight on how we use it to improve our magnetics design process. Uh, the whole subject of this presentation is based around a tool that we found called FEMM, stands for Finite Element Method Magnetics. Um, it's an open source tool that you can download. I'll give you the link in a moment. And it's a fantastically powerful tool for what is essentially a free, a free to access tool. It's used a lot in academia as well. Um, it's only a 2D tool. It, it doesn't have the 3D capabilities, but it does allow you a very low cost way and a, and, and a, and a very very shallow learning curve to get into FEA analysis to improve your magnetics design. So here's, oh, well, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll finish the agenda first. So um, we, we're going to use this tool to take a detailed look at that 50 watt flyback transformer. If you joined the webinar last week, you might remember we, we detailed the design of a 50 watt flyback transformer. Well, I want to use what we did last week and perform some FEA on that now and see how it looks and see how the FEA results compare to what we saw in practice. Um, I'm also going to use the FEA tool here, the, the FEM tool, to show how we can use, uh, how we can design a two kilowatt LLC transformer. And if you remember back to the very early stages of our uh, Power for Knowledge series, I think it was webinar three, we talked about a two kilowatt LLC converter. And I want to use that as, a, as an example. The, 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 the key thing about the FEA tools we're finding is that if you're designing high power systems, that's where they start to come into play to the best effect because you really need to push performance on in terms of efficiency at high power. So FEA tools are great, a great fit to help you do that. We'll then have a bit of a summary and questions at the end as well. So firstly, where does FEA or where do these FEA tools fit for what we're doing here? So firstly, Normal equations that use use idealized models. Um, so they tend to um, predict an idealized model of where you think magnetic flux lines exist in your transformer. So for example, around air gaps and things like that, we don't assume any fringing. And for certain 
um, restricted cases, those normal sort of design equations like I showed you last week work just fine. Um, they get you very close to where you need to be and you can then just build your design and iterate it a little bit and it works just fine. However, when you start, as I say, moving to higher power levels where maybe air gaps are starting to get a bit bigger um, or leakage effects start to become important, um, fringing effects can't be predicted really very easily by those equations. And FEA is a perfect way to give you a, vis a visualization of what's going on in reality in your, in your magnetic component. So it's a great tool to see these, 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 these effects that can't really be predicted by equations. Um, it's also, we found it to be an eye-opening tool for getting, an, getting a handle and a feeling on what happens as you go up to higher frequencies in magnetics design. Um, again, it's quite difficult to visualize things like skin effects, proximity effects, and fringing related losses near air gaps. With the FEA tools that I'm going to show you today, you can actually vis start to visualize what's going on for at high frequency in your transformer design or your inductor design. And that's that's a very useful thing because you, you understand then how to start trading off different factors and improving your design. And as I mentioned before, it's really high power levels where those improvements have the, 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 the most benefit. And also the, the cost of iterating magnetics as you go up and up and up in power becomes higher. You know, for to, to rewind a 50 watt flyback converter transformer, it doesn't take very long to do that. But if you're having to do re, redesign and rewind a, a 30 kilowatt transformer um, for an LLC converter, then that takes a lot more cost and effort. So you, you're best off doing a lot more front, upfront work to try and de-risk that exercise. So, um, Jose, I'd like to launch question one here. This is the first of our polls today. And this is just to get, for us to get a little bit of an understanding on, on the sort of FEA tools that you, you, you might have experienced so far, whether it's something perhaps you've used already. So please do respond to that poll as it pops up on your screen. So the FEMM tool, just a brief background on this. This is, this is the tool we use in-house. Um, this is actually a 2D finite element tool, which I'll show you in a moment. And it's it's quite flexible. It can model magnetics design, which is what I'm going to show you today. Um, it can also model electrostatic heat flow and current flow problems. They're all just um, um, effectively using the same engine behind it just to model different physical effects. Um, heat flow is a particularly interesting one. And if you're going to join our webinar, I think it's in a week or so's time looking at thermal design, we can use this FEMM tool to do the thermal FEA analysis of our system as well. So once you learn that one environment, you can actually use it across those four different domains, which is actually quite an interesting thing to be able to do. Um, it was actually, it's just open source software and you can download it for free at the link on the screen here written by a gentleman called uh, Dr. David Mika. And he's done a very good job on this tool. It's, 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 it's very widely used now. So I do urge you to download a copy and have a play with it because you'll be surprised how quickly you can get up to speed on, on, uh, on using it for all sorts of different things. Um, Within just a few hours, you should be able to build up basic skills um, to model magnetics or thermal uh, thermal thermal designs. And again, maybe the focus of the webinar today is just to, to walk you through those first steps of a magnetics design to speed up your learning curve on that tool. So if you can use what we're talking about today in the webinar, download the tool and have a go yourself. You'll learn really fast how you can actually use this tool. It's, it's really great. Um, the great thing also, the, the license um, requirements of this, it's actually free to use as a design modeling tool in a commercial environment, um, all the results of it are. So it's, uh, we, we use it um, with, with all sorts of designs uh, in, in our power converters. So let's take a little bit of a look at what this tool looks like. Um, before I open up the tool, if you remember last week, this is our 50 watt flyback transformer. Um, and we actually, as part of that webinar, we showed you the results from winding this part in practice and taking measurements. And what I'm gonna show you now, I'm actually gonna load up the FEMM tool and put a representation of that transformer into the tool and start looking at some of the performance uh, that the FEA or some of the results that the FEA analysis can give us. Now, hopefully this will, this will work okay. Um, we've not tried using this tool on a webinar before, so please bear with me. Hopefully it'll work. So if I just stop sharing that screen, 
and start sharing a different screen. Bear with me just a moment. Yeah, here we go, hopefully. Right, so hopefully this is what you will see when you open up your FEMM tool, just a blank screen like this. So I'm going to walk you through how we set up a um, our, our 50 watt flyback transformer analysis. So first of all, we need to create a new file. And you get the choice here to make it um, uh, which type of problem you've got. So I'm gonna choose magnetics problem, but there, there you can actually choose which, which of those four options you want. Okay, and we're presented by a screen here. Um, you need to define a few things before you can start drawing out your, your solution here or your, your problem here. So firstly, we click on problem to define what this system is. So firstly, I'm going to work in millimeters. Um, so you need to define that as millimeters here. You can use whichever that you prefer, but I, I prefer millimeters. You can see here as well, you can define the frequency um, that the analysis is done at. And later on in this webinar, I'll show you the difference of looking at a DC analysis versus a high frequency AC analysis, because that obviously affects all of these things like fringing losses, impedance of windings, that sort of stuff. For the moment, I'll leave it as DC, so zero frequency. Everything else we can leave as the same. So we just click on OK, and we get our blank page. Now, the next thing we need to do is to draw a cross section of our magnetic circuit. Um, you can, I believe in, with this tool, you can import a DXF file. I, I've not, I'm not gonna actually do that today. I'm just gonna define all the different points that I have which define my magnetic circuit. So bear with me as I draw these. What I need to do, you can see here, there's a little point source defined. So I use the tab key and I can just enter coordinates. So the first bottom left corner, of my transformer is going to be zero zero then we have zero and 30.4 so this bit's a bit boring because it's just watching me type in numbers but hopefully you will start to see the transformer core taking shape 30.4 comma naught if i zoom out here what you should see on your screen yet those four dots are the periphery of our e30 core so i'm just going to draw, draw the outside here so we're putting these lines on. So you can, importing a DXF probably would be a, an easier way to do it. Oops, I've got a point in the wrong place there. Let me, let me just change that. Um, let me, I'll just define those two points again. So we need 30 comma naught, 30 30.4. That looks a bit better. Let's put those lines back in. Okay, so this is the, outer dimensions of our E30 core. Now we need to define some of the in, inner parts of this. And it's got an air gap in the center leg, this one. So let's put some more points in. Five, 24.9, so that's the inner side of that leg. Then we go 11.4 um, at 5.5. So do bear with me on this. It's not the most riveting thing to watch, but you'll see the benefits of all of this shortly. Um, we've got an air gap, so we need to define some points in the middle. It's a 0.28 millimeter air gap, so I've, I've pre-worked out all of the all of the values we've got. 15, 9, so that's one side. Let's again just draw in that one side. So here we go. So it's starting to take shape now. We need to draw in the other side. So again, back to the point entry mode. Um, 24.75. Okay, we're nearly there. And the last point coming in now, 18.6, 4 4.9. Right, um, so let's draw those lines in as well. So you can see this is starting to look like a cross section now through our E core. Actually, I've, once I've finished this, I remember there's one extra thing I need to put in the problem definition. And you'll see why that's important in a moment. 
So there's a cross section through my ferrite core now with an air gap in the middle. Um, now in the problems definition, if I go back here, one thing I didn't do is define what the depth um, factor was. So at the moment, this is just assuming I'm only going one millimeter back into the page, which is obviously not the case. If you if you look up the uh, data sheet for the EF30 transformer core, it's um, it's 7.3 yeah 7.3 millimeters deep. And that's important to specify, otherwise obviously the results don't uh, are not going to be accurate. So we specify the depth of 7.3, that's the depth back into the cage. Uh, sorry, back into the page. Um, so you can see here, we've got what looks like a nice representation of the cross section through our core. We need to now start defining some material types um, because obviously we've got air, we've got ferrite material, and in, in a moment I'm also going to put some windings in here. So let's go into the materials library and see what we've got. So firstly, you can see that all the different materials that you, you have here, um, you just need to drag across the ones you want. So we need to have air um, because we've got an air gap and we've got air in the, in the periphery of the windings here. Uh, you can see I've also defined two types of N87 ferrite material, which will pop up here. Um, the difference between the two, in fact, we can take a look. The linear one just assumes that there's no saturation, which is not correct. Uh, and the one that's just called N87, we've actually um, got a, a BH curve in here, which we can take a look at. So I've imported the BH curve from the data sheets from TDK. It's actually, uh, I've modified it slightly because you can't include hysteresis in, in, in this. Um, uh, so hopefully that shows you uh, the, 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 the BH curve Actually, I'm not sure whether you'll be able to see that on your screens or not. Possibly not. Um, no, you won't be able to. OK, I'll, I'll leave that one for the moment. But you can define linear and nonlinear materials there. Um, OK, so we've got air, we've got ferrite material, and we need to put some copper in here as well for the windings. So let's, for the moment, we're going to assume a metric wire. And if you remember back from the webinar last week, we actually have, I think it's 0.5 millimeter wire. So let's put some 0.5 millimeter copper wire in, into our library as well. Okay, so we want to define material types now. So we do that here uh, in our materials definition clicker. So we click there and we can go in and we're gonna specify this as, we'll just do it as linear, uh, N87 linear ferrite material. And I think the mu, that just assumes a constant mu R of about 1600. So we're not modeling any sort of saturation uh, characteristics there. Um, and we just click okay. We want to also model air. So we've got air certain, actually yeah, let's move that for the moment. Let's put it um, right over here. So that's going to be air. Um, the other thing we haven't done yet is to model uh, or to show where the windings actually sit. Um, and for the moment, because this is a, a flyback transformer, we're interested at the moment um, in at least what I'm going to show you here is the primary inductance. So we're just going to put a block of windings in here, which are the primary windings. And we do that and you can define it in different ways. You, you can actually draw the windings as circular cross section parts or you can define a block which contains the windings. And the block approach is the quickest way to, 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 for the system to calculate results. It's less accurate, but for, for, for the purpose of the demonstration here today, I'm just going to use a block approach. And then later on in the slides that I'm showing you later, I'll show you some of the results we get when we start using a more detailed description of the windings. So let's put blocks in for the windings. So again, bear with me as I put in the coordinates for this. So that's one block of primary. So 10, 5, 5, and 22.7. I'm slightly in the wrong place. So let's do it here. We go 10.55, 22. Okay. Um, and this is the boring bit, um, and seven, and so what we're doing here, this is just one side of the windings at the moment, we'll do the other one shortly, this is just one layer 
of the primary winding. But when you, if you were on the webinar last week, you can see we actually had two layers of primary windings. We had an interleaved approach. So this is the first layer. Let's put the second one in as well. Six, five, and seven, eight, six, five. Sorry, it's very, very, very boring watching me typing in this, but I really wanted to show you just that creation from scratch of a of a of a natural design here. So these are our two layers of primary windings. Now, at the moment, you can't define the number of turns there. So we actually need to define a material type and we need to define a circuit. Um, so firstly, let's define what the actual circuits are. We need to, oops, that's the wrong button. Um, if we go to properties here and circuits, we, let's define a primary property, which is actually one of our circuits. So let's call that a primary winding. And if this is the peak circuit current, which remember is important for us working the peak flux density, and it's 1.07 amps. We click OK, so we've defined a circuit now. And if we click on the material here and just highlight in the region there, we can now define this as being part of our primary winding. So we'll use the 0.5 millimeter wire and we're also going to be defining it as being in the primary winding. And you can see here, there's also a number of turns. Um, on our transformer we've built, uh, we had 61 primary turns. So we're going to have 31 in the layer closest to the center leg and 30 in the outside one. So let's put 30 in this outside one. Do the same, but we're going to have 31 on the inside one. So in the primary winding, 31 turns. We've done that on one side, we now need to do it on the other side and then we're getting pretty close to being able to actually run a proper FEA analysis on this and you'll start to see some really interesting stuff at that point. So let's define the other winding over here. Oh, sorry, wrong button, there we go. Uh, so let's put the other points in. So we've got, um, oh, actually, what, no, the cool thing you can do here, uh, rather than defining all the points is we can do a block copy. So if I grab, uh, sorry, if I grab here, everything in that first layer, I can just copy it across. And I worked out the, the maths behind this earlier. We need to shift it across by 9.4 millimeters. And there you go, you see we've got that one nicely on the, on the other side and we do the same thing here for the extra layer here. This one, I think we have to move by, yeah, 13.2 millimeters. So that's good. We've got most of that problem defined now. The only thing is, at the moment, um, we it, it, uh, we have to define the windings on the other side of the center leg as actually having a negative number of turns because um, if you imagine that cross section through the transformer like this, we have to define one side of the windings as current going into the page and the other side of the windings is current coming out of the page. Because remember, we're going round uh, like this with our, with our windings. If the, if the windings both go straight into the page, it doesn't make any sense from a magnetics design perspective. So the way this tool defines current coming out of the page is we have to go into the um, circuit definition part here and just put that as minus 30 turns. And then similarly here, minus 31 turns okay so that's looking pretty good we've got our copper we've got the ferrite there we um we most of most of these designs you do need to have a boundary condition as well in our case here we probably would get away with it because the ferrite is a closed circuit but i will put a boundary condition in here anyway just for completeness so normally you, you can there are different ways of doing uh, of doing this but um what i found to work well is we just go 10 centimeters back from each corner at least that's what i'm going to show you here today so let's put those points in minus 100 minus 100 minus 100 and then the top point is going to be uh, 130.4 and then we're going to go 130, 130.4. And then the last point, 
We're getting closer now, folks. Uh, <laughs> I hope this is gonna be worth it. 130 and minus 100. And if I, oops. oh, sorry, wrong button, there we go. Um, now, if I uh, zoom out, you can see I've got the periphery there. If I just zoom out one more bit, I can put these boundary conditions in here. Okay. Right. Uh, and then we'll zoom back in somewhere in the middle, just because that's the bit we're interested in. Now, th the fact we've put boundary conditions in here, we do need to define this as being having a material type. Um, so let's put that as air. Yeah. Okay. And let's just save that. <laughs> uh, where are we over here? File. Let's save that. And let's call that as just. Okay. Right. Um, now, then hopefully there's nothing I've forgotten to do there. Let's see what happens when we actually do a, uh, well, firstly, we create a mesh. Okay, so the mesh has now been created, um, which is how this tool then goes about doing the FEA analysis. And if I now click on the little handle with the uh, the cog button in it, let's see what happens. There we go. It's it's done it. Now it's done it very quickly because I defined the windings as uh, as being these block elements here. Let's have a quick look at the results. So this is a visualization. If I now zoom in. So this is, you know, taken maybe 15 minutes to define. If I zoom in here, you can start to see the flux lines flowing. Um, now, there's all sorts of different ways of visualizing what this looks like. Um, the first thing we can do, I always think is nice, is to look at a um, essentially a density plot. So you can he see here, uh, we can choose to look at a density plot, so we start to see some colors. Um, I always prefer to have a lower bound of flux density of zero. And the upper bound here is pretty close to 0.3 Teslas because that was our design target. But I'll put it in as 0.3 so we've got a nice clear number here. And we click go. And there we go. Um, this is our first FEA result for that EF30 transformer here. Uh, and you can see here the flux density uh, in colors from zero up to about 0.3 or 300 milli Tesla. Um, there's a concentration here in the center limb because the center limb area is actually slightly smaller than the sum of the two outer areas. The other interesting things you start to see here is you're getting some flux density crowding effects near the corners here. Now, if we actually had a material that uh, was nonlinear, so we actually had a normal N87 material with a proper BH curve, what you see happening is, is, is actually a slight partial saturation in those corners. So you start, you don't see as such an extreme um, uh, flux density limit there. So it's important to use the proper material types really. Um, the, the next thing to see from this is there's a really, really neat <laughs> output you can look look at here. If we look at the circuit properties, remember we defined that circuit on the on as, as being the primary winding with 1.07 amps flowing. If we take a look at the circuit properties, and this is under DC conditions, you can see all sorts of different metrics here. You can look at voltage drop, um, and the voltage drop is just based on the DC resistance of the winding here. But look, the flux per current essentially is our inductance of that primary winding. So the FEA tool has predicted from that drawing with that many turns that we have about 870 microhenries, um, which is not far off what we wanted it to be. The, the design target for this one or it was one millihenry for this particular part. Uh, so why have we got a slightly lower inductance? Well, this is why FEA tools are quite useful um, because uh, there's a number of things going on here. For a small air gap like we've got here, we, we made the assumption that the air, when we were designing this part, that the air gap dominated the reluctance of the, of the overall core. However, uh, sorry, the reluctance of the overall system. However, the with small air gaps like this, that's not completely true. And I think in this case, in a, in a few slides time, I'll show you the difference there. So this means we actually need a slightly longer air, a sort of slightly shorter air gap than we, we, we were anticipating to get the required inductance. So that's, that's a really neat feature here. Um, you can do other sorts of things as well. And again, I'll show you some of this later on. If I go back 
and actually define a line. So I want to have, I want to take a section and look at the flux density as we go through that center line of the transformer. So we can start to get a feeling on what's going on near the air gap. I can go back, oops, if I click OK, I can go back anyway. I can go back to my block definition and put some more points in, just two points this time. Um, there we go. And I'm going to define those at minus one and I think, yeah, 15.2. So that's a dot, if you see that on your screen here, just to the left of the transformer core. And I'll put another one in at um, 31 and 15.2. So that has defined those two points. Let me just run the analysis again. Luckily, it, it goes pretty quickly. And let's visualize that output. So this is what we had before. But now what I can actually do is put a contour here across to there. And I can plot various different parameters as a function of distance along that contour. So let's just do that for flux density. So we're going to plot flux density as a, fun as a, as a function of distance of, along that line. And let's see what we get. And there we go. You can see that as we move along that line, firstly, in the outer limbs, we see a very rectangular flux density, and there's very little flux outside the transformer core. Um, as we move into the outer leg, you, it increases very quickly. And then as we move into the inter or, or beyond the, 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 actually it's probably better if I, see, let me see if I can do this. This might work a bit better. Um, yeah, let's just shrink that down a little bit and I'll try and, I'll try and match these up a little bit because it's easier to explain. There we go, that's a bit better. So you can see in the outer leg here, as we progress along the line, we get a nice rectangular flux density of about 0.2 Tesla. Um, as we then move into the internal sort of air uh, where the windings sit, we start to, well, we initially we've got very low flux density, but as we move closer to the air gap here, we start to see the air gap, uh, sorry, the flux density start to increase. And this is because of the fringing effect around the transformer air gap. Maybe I'll zoom in on the, the, the density plot in a minute and show you that. But you can see as we get closer to the air gap, the flux density starts to increase. Then as we start to move through the, 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 the air gap in, you know, um, underneath the, the, the center leg of that device, we start to get a flat profile here, um, slightly higher because the, the area of that gap is slightly less than, um, sorry, the area of that center leg is slightly less than twice the outer uh, limb areas. And because of the symmetry, we then see the same sort of an effect here. So this is great. This is a great tool for understanding where those fringing fields occur. And fringing fields near windings start to cause problems, as you'll see later on. Um, what I might do before I close this tool, let's have a little zoom in of that air gap and see what it looks like. There we go. So this tool is quite a neat way to start to see the fringing effects as you know as we approach the air gap. So it's it's a very good way to get a, a get a feel of what's really going on inside your magnetic component. And, and you can see it's taken a little while to put the details of my of my magnetic component into this. But there's no other real way of, of, of analyzing this using equations, or not, not that I know of anyway. Um, this is a great way just to get a perspective on how these systems behave and, 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 and how you can therefore design them better. So I hope, uh, I hope I've done a good enough job on showing you at least the magnetics capabilities of this tool and encourage you enough to download and have a play with it. Um, it does take a, maybe a couple of hours just to get used to entering in the data as I showed you today. Um, but once you get used to the, the environment, you can start to do a lot of stuff very, very quickly. Um, so let's go back to the main presentation now. Okay, bear with me, I just pop back to my presentation. There we go. Okay, cool. So um, that showed you the DC modeling of our uh, 50 watt flyback transformer that we that was the subject of last week's presentation. Um, let's look at the DC analysis of this again. So I showed you the DC analysis before. And here, these are the plots you saw from last time. So I won't go into those. Now, I mentioned that we also had the ability to use nonlinear um, ferrite material. 
And that if we use nonlinear ferrite material, this is what we get. Uh, we get a slight saturation effect in the corners where that flux crowding happens, which means that when you get saturation or partial saturation, the mu R start or the mu value starts to drop. Um, so in that case, the flux can't flow there. So you just don't get the same crowding. It, you don't get the same hot spots that the, 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 the linear version of that ferrite material shows. But from a perspective of the air gap behavior, it's pretty much the same. And if you look at the electrical behavior, we have a little bit of difference between the, the predicted inductances here, probably because um, of the difference behavior, the difference in the mu, the mu values between a linear and a nonlinear um, ferrite model here. But generally, we, from a DC analysis perspective, we, we're pretty happy with those results. That, that's, a, that's a good result. We're confident with the design. Um, I mentioned before when we first did the analysis that the, um, the, the, the primary inductance was below what we wanted. And actually the values, if we look at the, the just an analysis of the reluctance of the core and a reluctance of the gap for this part, for the core, we've got about 526 times 10 to the three. And for the gap, it's about um, six or seven times that. So the core is still a reasonable percentage of the overall reluctance. And that's why the inductance per term was a bit lower than what we expected. Um, we've got a DC resistance here of about 80 milliohms in that case. And keep that number in mind as we progress through the, the AC analysis. Okay, Jose, so that's um, question two now for the polls. If you could launch that, that would be great. Okay, so let's now move on to an AC analysis. So all of the stuff we've done so far is DC. I, if I go back into my FEM model and specify 100 kilohertz operation rather than zero, um, we can then do the same analysis. And you can see here, I've actually drawn the windings as physical uh, turns rather than, um, rather than block windings. And you'll see why I've done that in a minute. Um, for a DC, uh, sorry, for the AC analysis, the flux density, actually looks pretty similar to the DC case. Um, one thing the tool can't do, or at least I've not found a way to make it work yet, is predicting hysteretic losses in the ferrite material. I don't know how to do that with this tool. I have to use just normal analytical approaches. So at the moment, the flux density behavior looks very similar to DC. Now though, let's take a look at the winding current density. And, and, and this is just a, a sort of a qualitative plot I wanted to show you. Um, here, we, we're looking rather than at a, flux, a density plot of flux density, we're looking at the current density and the windings. And you can see quite a few things going on here. Firstly, as we get windings which are sitting closer to the air gap, we start to get much higher current densities in those windings. And that's because the fringing fields that I showed you in that FEA analysis are starting to impinge on that first layer of windings and they, they cause eddy current losses or they anything conductive which those fringing fields can can link through will tend to cause eddy current losses and that increases the the um the rms current in those windings here that's why we're getting an increase in current density in the in the windings near to the air gap as we move away from the air gap what you're starting to see are really just skin effect and proximity effect losses. So with a with 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 skin effect, the what the high frequency the current wants to flow around the outside of the wire, and also with proximity effects, if you've got two windings side by side with the current going in the same direction, they tend to repel. Um, that they want to flow on opposite sides of the periphery of those windings. Um, and what you're seeing here in that uh, in that current density are those effects. So it's quite a useful way to be able to sort of um, qualitatively visualize the impact of operating at higher frequencies in this design. Um, so they're the, the effects that I've just described. Uh, if you take a look when you um, at, at the circuit properties when you've done that high frequency AC analysis, you can extract parameters like we did for the DC case. And in the case here, remember before we had a resistance at DC of about, I think it was 80 milliohms, it's gone up to about two ohms now, at least the, the, the real part of that, of that voltage um, over current expression, which is our resistance. That's gone up to about 2.2 ohms, which is a significant increase. 
But the interesting, I think this is actually a bit of luck. And I thought I'd put this metric in because in webinar nine, we actually measured the resistance at DC and at 100 kilohertz. So for comparison on the physical part we made, um, our DC resistance was actually quite a bit higher than the FEA tool um, modeled. However, the high frequency resistance was very close. Now that's probably a little bit of luck. You don't normally get them to line up quite like that. So like anything, these FEA tools, you have to take the, art, the, 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 the answers they give you uh, with a degree of caution. Um, but you can, the, the, the interesting thing is the difference. You know, we've gone up by a significant factor in terms of our um, resistance of the winding up at 100 kilohertz. So that's, that sort of confirms what we're seeing in practice and also with what we're seeing in, in terms of skin effect, proximity effect and fringing effect. Okay, so let's briefly summarize that flyback converter. So the finite element analysis of that flyback uh, design that we've done gave electrical properties which were similar to those that we expected from the design equations and that we got from physically building and winding the thing last week. Um, the small air gaps, for small air gaps, the core reluctance, you can't really ignore it. It does have an impact on the total reluctance of the magnetic component. So it tends to reduce the inductance per turn you, you, you get. And we saw that in the FEA model as well, if you remember. Um, I think it's always nice to visualize magnetic circuits because it just gives you a bit of a deeper understanding on how they're performing. But to be honest, for most low power flyback converters, you, you probably don't need, well, you don't really need to do an FEA analysis unless you're really interested in it. Um, because the, you know, the if you get it slightly wrong, that the, the, just to rewind a new a new 50 watt flyback transformer is quite a trivial thing to do. So um, it's a, it's an interesting academic exercise, and by all means, play around with it. But you don't really need to do it. There's 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 limited gain for low power systems to, in, in doing that. Um, however, and there's always a, a, a caveat there. I think the real benefit of FEA is when you then take up. Uh, and move to higher power levels where that, that cost of iterating a design becomes potentially prohibitive. You want to do more upfront work. So I'd like to briefly outline doing the same approach for a two kilowatt LLC transformer. You'll be pleased to know I'm, I'm not going to run the tool live here and, and, and enter loads more points because I think there's limited value in that. So I'm just going to show you the results of it. But please do, do, do play around with the tool yourself if you can. So um, if you were, uh, if you joined us on webinar three, our DC to DC conversion webinar, we showed a two kilowatt LLC converter using silicon carbide, and um, these are the actual. This is actual real measured data from that two kilowatt converter. Um, it was designed for an arbitrary sort of a power level, six hundred volts input, and a typical. Uh, output of 400 volts at five amps. Although we get we, we we did test it over a wider range, but let's let's focus on that operating point um, for our design here. And let's look at the magnetics for using this, or, or look at look, look at what the magnetics look like when using FEA for to, to to take a look at that transformer design. So this is the LLC converter that we built. So it's a bit more an ideal idealized version of it. There's actually two magnetic components. There's our, our primary uh, side series resonant inductor, and then there's the transformer itself. Again, going back to the um, webinar three, we derived the, the actual requirements of those parts, which I'm not going to repeat here, but just take bring those, those factors forward so we can use them. So for the LR inductor, in our case, uh, about 35 microhenries, a peak current of just over 10 amps, and the other data here, uh, uh, 9.2 amps of RMS, of RMS current and energy storage of about 2 millijoules. For the transformer, again, um, these the this is the data we're going to design against. The interesting thing for the transformer is you can see there's a significantly higher energy storage requirement compared to the inductor. So the transformer is going to be bigger than the inductor, which sort of makes sense. Let's take those values forward, though, and see what that looks like for our physical design of our transformer. Oh, before I do that, though, um, for the 400 volt 5 amp load point running from a 600 volt input, we need to be running at about 106 kilohertz, which is similar to what we saw for the flyback converter. It's just a, a fraction higher here. So from webinar nine, um, if you attended that last week, we derived the area product approach for magnetics design, which we've applied to all sorts of things now. Um, 
For the resonant inductor, we can use that. Um, and the equation here is as shown in the yellow box. Um, with those factors here, we can assume a peak flux density. We're going to keep it quite low at about 100 millitesla, uh, a fairly low current density in the windings and a packing factor of 50%. These are all quite conservative design targets because we want to try and push the efficiency of our system high. So we're going to slightly oversize the magnetics just to give them a good, good operating efficiency. And for that energy storage requirement that we saw on the previous page, we get an area product of just over 40,000 millimeters to the four. And we can read off then, in our case here, we chose to use a, a PM5039 core set, which is again, slightly oversized here, but it should mean we've got an easy to wind transformer. Um, and that will give us, uh, on that design, about two amps per millimeter squared current density in the winding. 13 turns and an air gap of about 1.7 millimeters. So you can see as we've gone up in power level now and we're getting to bigger components, air gaps are getting bigger. So the flyback converter was 0.28 millimeters. We've got 1.7 millimeters now for our inductor here. So fringing effects are gonna become more interesting. That's the um, core PM5039 core. I'm gonna focus on the transformer though for the FEA analysis just because of uh, the time we've got today. So with the transformer, we can use the same area product approach. Um, the only thing is, is that we've got a primary winding and a secondary winding. So I'm going to make the bold assumption that the primary winding oc occupies about 50% of the available winding window. So therefore we get this factor of two in the core area product approach. Um, assuming a peak flux density of 150 milliteslas, about three amps per millimeter squared and the same 50% packing factor, we can work out what our ACAW product is. And for our 12.1 millijoule storage requirement, that gives us just over 215,000 millimeters to the four. And if we look through our range of, um, of transformer cores that we've, we've got available to us, that points us towards an E70 core, which is, or E703332, which is again, slightly oversized, but we'd rather have it to be slightly oversized than undersized here, because we're trying to push the efficiency. So with that E70 core, we can run about 2.5 amps per millimeter squared, 20 primary turns, eight secondary turns, and an air gap of about 1.86 millimeters should give us the, the operating point we need. And there's the E70 core, so 70 millimeters by about 66 millimeters in, in terms of cross section. So question three now, uh, Jose, if you could launch question three, I'll, I'll move on to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so I've, again, put all of those details into our FEM tool. Um, and you can see here, again, I've just, I've just put the 20 primary turns on here and the 1.86 millimeter air gap. Um, and I think this is just a DC analysis here. And again, you can take that section through the center of the transformer here and plot flux density out as we go. And you can see here, now we've got an air gap of 1.86 millimeters. We're starting to get quite significant flux density levels um, in the air where the windings are. Now this has got the potential to cause us a lot of loss in our system if we're not careful. So we've got to start to be careful with our design here. Um, you can see here again, if I look here, yeah, this is a DC analysis. You can see here, um, we've got about 214 or so, yeah, 214 microhenries, which, which is actually more than we want this time rather than less. Now, the reason we've got more inductance than we want is that we actually have uh, an air gap here, which is bigger because of the fringing than we expect. And if you have a bigger air gap, that means you get more inductance per turn than you're expecting. Um, so that's why we've got slightly bigger inductance here. Um, if I then do the same analysis uh, at 106 kilohertz, which is our operating point for that, that, that system, um, you can see here that the resistance has gone up to about 0.2 of an ohm compared to what we had before. Now that seems like an arbitrary, that seems like a very low resistance for the winding and there's a reason that it's quite low. When I was defining this problem in the FEMM tool, 
rather than just using um, you know solid copper strands, you can actually define um, you can define lits wire as or, or these bundles being formed of lits wire. And I think in the case here, it, I, I used four hundred strands of uh, 36 AWG, which is 0.127 millimeters diameter wire. Um, so by using uh, high frequency lips wire, we can start to avoid the, some of the losses that at high frequency that we see due to skin effect, proximity losses and fringing losses as well. Um, so high power, high frequency, if you start using lips wire, you can get a significant step up in performance. Um, and in fact, let's take a look at the impact of that Litz wire. So I did exactly that same 106 kilohertz analysis uh, on the same design. And in one case, I used a uh, Litz wire, which was formed from 40 strands of 0.4 millimeter wire. And 0.4 millimeter wire is okay for a skin depth of, um, uh, yeah, oh, sorry, is okay for skin depth at 100 kilohertz. But then I compared it against 400 strands of 0.127. And in both cases, we've got around about five millimeters squared of, of copper, which is about right for the current density we're trying to achieve with this design. So firstly, this is the result of the current density uh, with 40 strands of 0.4 millimeter outer diameter wire. You can see here, even at high frequency, the current density in the winding is largely uniform. And that's because of the, 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 the treatment of the Litz wire here in the FEM model. Um, so you don't get the same sort of um, behavior that you would do if this was just a single strand of, of chunky copper. Um, and in that case here, with 40 strands of 0.4 millimeter wire, we have a resistance in the primary of about 1.4 ohms. And with the current that we've got, and that's 1.4 ohms at 100 kilohertz, with the RMS current we've got flowing here, that equate, would equate to 94 watts of loss in that primary winding with 40 strands of 0.4. Let's compare that to 400 strands of 0.127 wire. So again, we've got roughly the same current density in the winding here, but the difference now is if we look at the resistance that the FEA tool comes up with, look at the difference here. We've got, rather than having 1.42 ohms, by using the 400 strands of, of much finer wire, so same same amount of copper in total, we've gone down by a factor of about seven here in terms of our, of our resistance at 100 kilohertz. And therefore we go down in, in power loss by a, a similar factor of about seven. So from, from 94 watts down to about 13 watts. So you can really start to see if, if, if you can use very fine stranded lits on high power systems, even at 100 kilohertz, it can make a massive difference to the efficiency, or sorry, the power loss of your of your magnetic com um, components and, and therefore the efficiency of your system. Um, a brief slide, I wanted to talk about um, another way you can improve performance in your high power magnetics. So at the moment, we're assuming that we've just got a single 1.86 millimeter gap just in the center leg of our transformer, and we saw some fairly large fringing fields as a result of that. Um, again, the inductance is a little bit high, 214 microhenries. But if we now take a look at the flux density as we move down through this arrow here, so imagine plotting flux density as we move through that layer of windings from top to bottom, we want to see how big that flux density becomes in the region of the air gap. And I've turned this on its side again, just to try and match that uh, that 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 uh, y dimension. You can see as we move towards the air gap, the flux density in that first set of windings, or in where I've drawn the line here, starts to increase significantly. And in this case, we measured up to about thirty millitesla. Um, now, the the absolute value there is is less important at the moment. Um, the point is is that we've got a single air gap which concentrates the flux density in that region of windings at about thirty millitesla. Uh, some of you may come, may have come across and already used distributed air gaps, but uh, what a distributed air gap is is you rather than having one single gap is you you put multiple smaller gaps in and the reason you do that is it avoids this single hot spot if you like and the fringing effects that come from that it's you, you actually have far less fringing if you can use multiple smaller gaps so i've done that in the fea tool 
again. So uh, for roughly the same inductance, it's not quite the same, but roughly the same. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll pull it up in a minute. You can see we've got three air gaps now. And you can see we're actually, uh, I, I adjusted it to give us something a little bit closer to the inductance we wanted, which was the inductance we wanted was 185 microhenries. So we've got 178. So we're getting a little bit closer now. Now, if I do the same treatment here and look at the flux density in that first set of windings here, obviously we're going to get three peaks now rather than one. And each of those peaks, in this case, the FEA tool indicates for that same position, we've got about 10 milli Tesla. Um, now, I, uh, the, the important thing here is uh, the, 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 I, I suspect the, the losses that that flux density causes is probably quite nonlinear. So if you have 30 milli Teslas, it's going to give you significantly greater heating in the winding than three lots of 10 milli Tesla. Um, it's, I haven't found a way to actually calculate that here, but the benefit of splitting into multiple smaller gaps is that the you're firstly you're spreading the heat over a wider area but also the total amount of dissipation is reduced because these fringing or these peak flux densities are just lower and that means less heating in the winding um, and that's question four then please jose um uh, if you could launch that one um as i come to the end of this webinar uh, the other thing that's quite a useful feature of uh, the FEA tools is it gives you the ability to experiment with all sorts of different magnetic structures. And when you start taking those steps of experimenting with different magnetic structures, you come up with all sorts of clever different, different ideas. And this one here is just a, a fairly commonly used technique, but I thought I would demonstrate it because it's it's another way that you can, you can implement your LLC converter by using integrated magnetics. So, what I mean by that is rather than having a, that separate PM50 discrete inductor um, sitting outside uh, or having two magnetic components on the LLC, you could actually implement that by designing to have a high leakage in your transformer from the outset. And that's feasible to do up to reasonable power levels. And, and I, you can use an FEA tool such as the FEM tool just to get an understanding on, on how you might do that. So. If, if you've played with magnetics before, you know a good. Normally, what you're trying to do is create good coupling between windings, so they need to sit near one another. However, if you want to create a high leakage inductance, which you do for an LLC potentially, you want to space those windings apart. So what I've done here is to do that with the FEA tool to just try positioning the the windings differently and see what sort of a leakage inductance we can get. Um, so there's our primary winding. I've just I've just put the primary winding on one side of the core, and then we have a gap, and then we have the secondary winding over here. This is also quite beneficial because remember that we had losses in the proximity of the air gap. By spacing them apart like this, you're keeping the windings away from those 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 fringing fields. So it has a knock-on benefit potentially in reducing fringing losses. Um, if I click on here, uh, it may avoid the need for an external resonant inductor. Um, what I've done here is because now I've got two magnetic circuits here, if I, um, or the way you normally measure leakage inductance is you normally short the secondary winding out and measure the uh, inductance on the primary side. So I've done the equivalent here and that, that essentially that's just by making sure that the current flowing in the primary winding is equal to the, the current flowing in the secondary winding and then the flux lines cancel and you end up with the leakage fields as I've shown here. Now if I do that and run the simulation in the FEMM tool, you can see here that we've got somewhere yeah, around about 16 microhenries of inductance on the primary side circuit. And that represents the leakage inductance or the, what the FEA tool is indicating the leakage inductance would be. Uh, that's not enough for our particular example. Remember, we needed something like 35 microhenries for our example. So you might want to experiment with maybe moving the, the, the windings further apart, or actually these are represented with um, block windings at the moment. Maybe we actually should model these as the, the real physical windings like I did in the earlier example, because that will give you a slightly different level of leakage as well. But you can see here, when you start becoming familiar with this sort of FEA analysis, it gives you a platform to experiment with all sorts of different stuff, which you can't really, or it's harder to do in practice. So it's, it's a great way to open your eyes onto, onto magnetics design, really. 
Um, you can visualize where the flux lines go. So in this case here, I've taken a center line through the middle of that structure. And you can see we've, we've now got a fair amount of flux density. So there's a lot of flux flowing in the region between the windings here. And that represents our leakage inductance. So it's again, it's another way of getting a deeper understanding of, of how those black box parameters relate to stuff that's really happening in the, in the actual system. Um, and when you start doing that, it then prompts your thought process to start thinking about novel magnetic structures as well. So, you know, you, you could actually imagine multiple um, magnetic elements that are being incorporated into the same physical item. And that, that's a really interesting area to explore because you can get, especially at higher frequency, you can get everything contained much more closely um, and possibly at lower cost as well. Okay, I think we're, 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 we're pretty much on the hour now. So I'm just going to briefly summarize uh, the content today and then we'll move on to some questions. Um, so firstly, we have found that the FEA approach is something that's very useful for high power designs because it gives you an understanding of where fringing fields and leakage fields exist. And it allows you to iterate your design and your knowledge to design better magnetic components. Um, it can model leakage inductance between the windings. Um, I'm, I'm not totally sure how accurate that is. I think you know that. I think you always have to, you you always have to sort of sit this sort of tool side by side with real practical verification and just make sure that your your models are are, are sensible. But it gives you a real intuitive feel on on, on where on, on on what's going on inside your system. Um, for high power systems, the cost and the time delays of iterating high power magnetics. Um, this is a really helpful way to try and de-risk that process. So you go through fewer iterations of design and therefore speed the project up. It, so it's it, for, certainly for systems of the multi kilowatt level, this is a great way to de-risk your design process. Um, and from my personal perspective, the, the real key thing from a designer is it gives you a better understanding of how magnetic components work. Um, and that is the key thing because then you design better stuff and you come up with new ways of doing things. So it's, it's a great way to open your eyes to magnetics design. Um, one brief um, acknowledgement. So um, uh, when we were looking at the modeling of the fringing losses and the skin effect losses, and that remember those current density white, uh, plots, um, I got in touch with a, co uh, a contact of mine from a uh, university in Israel who'd used this tool as well. And he supported on, on, on how to set the FEM tool up to model those sorts of effects. So I'd just like to say acknowledgements to um, Sam Benyakov uh, for, for helping us out on that. Thank you, Sam. Uh, and with that, I think we move on to the questions. Excellent. So let's have a look, see what sort of questions we've got coming in. Hopefully it's been useful for you. Yeah, we've got a few questions here. Um, let's have a quick look. Um, so firstly, there was a question here about the license. Um, uh, there isn't, you don't have to sign a license. So the question here is, um, the license is free to use. So the results in a convert commercial environment, is there a license document that's part or, or that, that outlines this? Um, there is, if you go to the, um, the website link that I gave you back at the start of the presentation, there is a link which um, describes I think, in fact, I might be able to pull it up. Let me have a quick look. Let me see if I can find it. Let me just double check this. Actually, I think you'll have to, yeah. You, I think I'm pretty sure it's on that on the website, on the link I gave you there. It does describe how you can use it. The only restrictions, you're, the only things you're not allowed to do with the, um, with the tool is to essentially, um, embed the source code in a commercial product and then sell that on. So you're free to use the results and the um, the data it gives you, but you can't reuse and sell on the sort of the engine of it uh, as I understand it. So worth digging through and having a look at that. But yes, there are some details on that website. Um, another question here, the definition of, of skin depth, should it be to the middle of the material for a cross section or the whole depth? So the skin depth is normally just the depth into, into the middle of the material. So for example, at 100 kilohertz, the, the skin depth or skin depth is typically um, when the, uh, the current density goes up, uh, sorry, the impedance goes up by a factor of one upon E. Um, and for 100 kilohertz in copper, that 
distance to the middle is about 0.2 millimeters and therefore you can get away with about 0.4 millimeter uh, outer diameter wire. Um, a question here, uh, is it possible to access last week's webinar or presentation notes? Um, yes, it is. Uh, so if you go to our website, which is www.electronicminds.co.uk and scan to the bottom of that page, you can um, you can access all of our webinars on demand now. Um, obviously, we've got, we, we've got one to nine there at the moment. Um, this one will go up this afternoon as well. So but yes, you can access those on our webpage. Hi, I, I, I also posted the link on the chat. So if they go to the okay. chat, they can see the link. Thanks, Jose. That's great. Yes. So we, um, yeah, we've put them all up there. You should be able to get them. Um, uh, can you use the, the FEM tool to estimate core loss? Um, I've not found a way to do that yet. Um, I'd like to be able to do that, but I don't know how to do it yet. Um, when you um, when you enter the uh, N87 ferrite material, which was the, the ferrite grade that I entered, you enter a BH curve, um, but most any normal BH curve has got hysteresis. You know, you've got the, the you, you, as you go up and it, uh, you get to a certain point, as you come back, it follows a different path. With the FEA tool here, you can't put a hysteresis curve in there. It has to be the same curve up on the way on the way up and way down. And that pretty much means you, I don't think that, well, you certainly can't use the BH curve as a way to model the loss um, in that because to have loss you have to have a uh, an area contained within that curve because it's it's the area of the curve which relates to the loss. Um, so I don't know. I don't think so. Um, what the way we've tended to go around looking at core loss is to use the Stein Metz approach, um, pretty much the standard sort of approach which we covered in the in the webinar last week. Um, if you do find a way to use the FEMM tool to estimate core loss, then please let me know because I'd love to know how to do that, but I haven't found a way to do it yet. Um, okay. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just scanning some, some questions here. Okay, what's the effect of winding window factor on the efficiency or other things? why they avoid greater than 50 percent occupancy oh okay so this is this is the packing factor um and th this is really the f a, a number that represents the fact that you can't have or it's very hard to have 100 percent of your winding window which is filled with copper because you've got insulation in there um or not on the outer parts of the windings you might have layers of tape you might have margin tape as well to give you creepage and clearance and if you've got a round cross section of, of wire, you can't, you know, the way you stack the windings up, you're always going to have gaps of air in there. So it's really just a, a figure to represent um, how effectively you can utilize that window area. Uh, if you can wind them very, very well uh, and you have minimal insulation, you might get greater than 50 percent. But it's, it's actually quite challenging to get it to be higher than that. Um, so uh, you, you might get it better, but you, you, you certainly can't use 100% because you'll, you won't be able to fit your winding in. Um, Hi, Ian. Yeah. There's an interesting comment on the chat regarding the core losses. So if you ah, go to okay. the chat, so... Oh, yes, I can see that. So um, somebody has um, uh, commented... Oh, someone else knows Sam Ben Yakov. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Firstly, um, uh, secondly, so there was a comment here. I've seen a paper claiming to have done that in ANSYS Maxwell, but unfortunately, he didn't really go into details. Um, yeah, so I mean, that that may well be the case. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the person who put that up, if they're willing to send me a copy of that paper, I'd love to take a look at it um, uh, because I'm interested in that as well. If you could start modeling these sorts of loss mechanisms, that would be fantastic. Um, in fact, I'll be interested to look at the polls to see how many people have used ANSYS Maxwell. Uh, we, we haven't used it here, mainly because it's a very, very expensive tool um, and probably a lot more complex to learn than something like FEMM. But if it is possible to do that sort of analysis, then fantastic. Okay. Um, um, maybe we'll just do one more question here. Um, Okay, so we did get one further comment for core shapes with a round middle core, like an ER core and maybe an ETD core as well. The cross-section view in 2D will look like an E core. Is this expected to affect the FEA results? Yeah, it's an interesting one, that one. Um, 
we actually, when I was putting this webinar together, um, I was looking at modeling a different, a different um, transformer core for the, for the LLC, uh, one based on an ETD approach, which has the round cross section. The way I put that initially into the, into the FEA tool is I create, I turned it into a rectangular cross section of, of an equivalent area to that round cross section. Now, from a perspective of the um, magnetic circuit and flux density in the magnetic circuit, that makes no real difference because you, as long as your area is the same, you're okay. Where it will have a potential difference um, or, or, or an effect is on things like the fringing and, and the leakage inductances. So I don't know how much of a difference that makes it, it, if you have access to the ANSYS Maxwell tool that allows you to do 3D analysis, it would be very interesting to take a look at that. Um, I tend to, for the FEA tool I'm using here, I tend to try and only use the, 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 the rectangular cross-section parts just because it's a closer representation of, you know, of, of what I can model. Um, hopefully that's answered most questions here. Let me just have a quick look through. Um, I think this is one about the flux density simulation. Okay. In the space between oh, the two. Okay. Yeah. In the FEM flux density simulation, why couldn't we see the flux density in the space between the two windings, i.e. the winding air gap? Um, that's, a, no, that's a very good point. Uh, the, the, the reason probably is that the scale that I used on the, um, on the density plot um, probably made the colour of that the, well, the, the flux going through between the windings is tiny in comparison to the flux going through the core. So I suspect we just couldn't see it. Um, maybe if I actually, let, let's have a quick look at it. Maybe I can bring up, if I stop sharing that one, let's have a quick look and see what we can see. Um, application window. So this is going back to our application window here. Um, and if I zoom out, and then zoom in again. Let's take a look. Um, in fact, what we could do, let's take a little look. If I, I'm wondering if I can, hmm, bear with me a minute. I'll just put another contour on and we'll take a look at that. Um, so if I go to here and put some more points on here. Um, so, Let's have a look. Uh, Ten point three. I'm just doing a bit of maths here, so maybe about a millimeter back. So uh, nine point three naught, and another point on nine point three and thirty point four. So I'm just defining those two points so that we can put a contour through that. Let's run a quick simulation of that and look at the answers, and then we'll define that contour so this we're interested i think in that question in the in the flux density as we go through between the windings here so let's take a look at that i mean that's the whole benefit of this sort of a tool is you can do these sorts of experiments yeah so if, if you can see here um if i just make that a bit smaller so you're gonna have to turn your heads on the side a little bit here um if i move that over there as we go through the center of the winding here the what you're seeing here is obviously we've got flux density in the in the in the in the legs and the ferrite here it drops to zero and then from about this point here which i think if i look at that's oh, about 7.4 um i think i did it yeah so seven point from about seven i think 7.7 .7 .7 millimeters which would be about here on our plot we start to see the flux density increasing. Um, if I maybe if I go back in and change the scale on the plot here, we can actually see that a little bit better. So rather than going from naught to 300 milliteslas, let's go to say 30 milliteslas and see what that looks like. Yeah, so here you can see now that we're starting to get a non-zero flux here between the windings but actually that's i think that's probably as a result of the air gap it's not a result of the windings i think i think the question that's actually being asked by the um uh, there is when you normally have a primary and a secondary winding 
you will have non-zero flux density that results between the two. I've just not got a secondary winding on here at the moment, so we're not seeing it. So hopefully, I think that that's really what the question is asking, asking there. But the important thing here is, is when you learn how to use the tool, you can actually put secondary windings in here and go and explore all of that stuff. Um, which So if you're going for like a multi-layer planar structure, for example, you'll be able to look at the buildup of, 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 of the flux density as you go through those that winding structure. So have a play around with the tool and you should be able to start to see that sort of a thing. I think we don't see it here because I haven't got the secondary winding on. Um, okay, I think that's probably it for today. We're bang on quarter past um, 11 now. So uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank you all for joining today. Hopefully I've encouraged you to have a play around with finite element approaches in magnetics um, problems like this. It really is an eye opener and I hope you found it useful today. Uh, and we hope to see you on future webinars. Thank you very much. Bye bye.